As much as life has changed over the last year, you're still pretty busy, so consider convenient COVID-19 testing from Quest. Get the same tests hospitals use without a doctor visit. Simply order online, select from drive through or at-home options, and get results sent securely to your phone or computer. It's a great fit for your busy life. With over 25 million COVID-19 tests processed, you can count on Quest. So order your test today at questcovid19.com. That's questcovid19.com. The new year can be a good time for a mental health check-in. If you always wanted to try therapy, or you'd like to try it again, or if you just need to talk some things out, BetterHelp offers online licensed professional therapists who are trained to listen and to help with issues including relationship conflicts, depression, self-esteem, grief, and more. With BetterHelp, you can simply fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and then get matched with your counselor in under 48 hours. Easily schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus exchange unlimited messages with your therapist from anywhere. Everything you share is confidential, and if for any reason you're unhappy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time, at no additional charge. Join the 1 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp counselor. BetterHelp is a convenient and affordable option, and our listeners get 10% off their first month with the discount code STITCHER. Get started today at betterhelp.com slash stitcher. There's no shame in asking for help. Welcome to Star Talk, your place in the universe where science and pop culture collide. Star Talk begins right now. This is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist and your host. This is a Cosmic Queries edition, and we were been long overdue to get a Cosmic Queries on the comet that has been in the sky. And so I had to bring in some expertise for that. But before we get to that, let's introduce my co-host for this episode, Nagin Farsad. Nagin, welcome back. Oh, hi, Neil. How are you? you did, after your first uh, visit to us, you didn't run away and, and not come back. You, you came back. I, I felt my head getting like larger with facts and knowledge, and I thought, let's do this again. <laughs> okay, one day your head will not fit on the screen, and then we'll know <laughs> we're, we're doing the right thing. I'm uh, taking Nagin- measurements. <laughs> Nagin Farsad is a, a, a stand up comedian, and if I remember correctly, you wrote a book called How to Make White People Laugh. Indeed. That's a crazy title. <laughs> That's just crazy. <laughs> It's, uh, I would like a comet to be named after my book. <laughs> we can make that happen. That. And uh, also, you host a podcast, Fake the Nation. That's Ooh. right. Yeah, these are very, very. Uh, uh, these are terms you just gotta you gotta just pick up that book and listen to that podcast because you want to know what the hell where where are you coming from on this? <laughs> You'll enjoy them. Uh, they'll, they're they're fun, uh, but they have like you know just a lot less science. But you'll still love them. Uh, yeah, and and you you write this not as a white person. You write this as a sort of Middle Eastern heritage yeah, person. That's right. I'm an Iranian American Muslim. You could probably tell from my voice. Yes, I, t- <laughs> I was going to pick it out. It's so right easy to tell on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're delighted to have you back. And we have a friend of Star Talk, Natalie Starkey. Natalie, welcome back. Hi, Neil. Yeah, Good you're you, you're our comet expert, and you're you're dialing in or or, or zooming in from Cambridgeshire, the yeah, UK, all the way in England. Very I very cool. Well, mm-hmm. welcome. And Thank you. Uh, many people don't know that uh, you wrote our most recent space show at the Hayden Planetarium, which I features did. planets as uh, as objects and planets as astronomical. Um, uh, targets of interest. So, just thanks, thanks for coming in to do that. I just that, wanted, no, so. and of course we went to visit a comet as well. Because how could I resist if we're going to go and look at things in the solar system? I'm like, we're getting at a comet in there. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, when the planetarium opens back up, and maybe we, you come back and visit. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't yeah, wait. Can I give one. listeners a little bit of an insight about the two of you? The green room chit chat before we started recording was about helium. 
Ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) This exciting stuff. (laughs) (laughs) That is what, I mean, so if you think they're talking about like, you know, Kanye West or something before we start recording, no, they're talking about helium before we start recording. Just so everyone's clear, these people are talking about it all day long, not just for this hour. (laughs) Natalie Starkey is a a colleague and who's a a professor at the, uh, is it the Open University? Oh, I'm actually um, a public engagement officer now. So, a public engagement yeah, officer. So, but yeah, I'm at the Open University. So I do a lot of physics public engagement because I discovered doing a lot of research. So I actually just love talking about science all the time. Okay, well, excellent. Doing it so much. So. Very excellent. And, and you've got a book and you've got videos. And so you're out there. You, you're trying to do what, what we're trying to do. So we're, Yeah, we're, I'm trying we're, to copy you, but I just... No, can't. that's I fine. Made, you want to take my place? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the Bahamas. You take my place. How about that? <laughs> okay. <fine. laughs> All right. So your expertise, I'm intrigued because your expertise in the solar system um, grew up out of your expertise thinking about Earth as a planet, mm. as, a, as a geological object. So um, that gives you a different kind of angle into what comets are than an astronomer would have. So I'm yeah, intrigued exactly. by that. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I started out as a geologist. I've always been fascinated by volcanoes. That was what got me into science. And then what I discovered from that is I loved doing chemistry on rocks. And then it just sort of grew from there. And my PhD was looking at understanding the Earth as a planet, how it formed four and a half billion years ago, how it evolved since then. Um, and so it was caught sort of a natural step when I saw the postdoc, which is the research position I had after my PhD. It was looking at comet and asteroid samples and doing the same kind of chemistry on them, but it was just looking at space rocks instead. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's so cool. I don't know anything about space rocks, but I'm going to jump in and give it a go. And I've just not looked back since then. I absolutely love it. But I still love volcanoes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mean to be biased, but space is cooler than geology. I oh, I don't know. I don't know if you thinking. need geologists in space. <laughs> uh, <laughs> rock. <laughs> Neil, you you got to be careful because I hear geologists can be very violent. So uh, oh. you might get some attacks after this. <laughs> they have you rocks just, that they can throw. <laughs> in de- <laughs> like actual rocks hammers. that they can touch. You yeah, can't we, touch your rocks, Neil. <laughs> we use hammers a lot to break those rocks. And I've actually hit my own shin with my own rock hammer before. By, when I actually missed the rock, it was so painful. So like, and if, yeah, if I, she, I'm not breaking it. Nagin, if she can do that to herself. I mean, <laughs> Imagine what she can do to others. Well, I, then, felt, I, I noticed a t- like a hint of violence in you, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Natalie, uh, you still have your eyebrows. So whatever love of volcanoes you had, you didn't lean too far in to have no, them singed. No, I've, I've, only, I've never seen a, like an actual eruption, but I've been on an active volcano many times. And, you know, just... And a volcano in the Caribbean that I worked on, you can literally hear the thing roaring as you're standing next to it. All the gas is escaping from it. It's absolutely amazing. I never knew that before I actually went to one um, and actually sort of had to understand its temperature and look at it in detail and measure its gases. But they're just, they're fascinating. I love volcanoes. And so we've got volcanoes in the solar system that are places other than Earth. So it's cool to have you. Uh, helping us That's think a good about link, those problems. Actually, my book coming out next year is all about space volcanoes. So, uh, so I've written. Yeah, my second book's just finished. So it's yeah, going to be a while till it comes out. But it's about all the volcanoes in the solar system, made of ice or made of rock. So right, ice volcanoes. That's right, mm. spewing chunks of ice. We think of volcanoes as hot objects, but it's really just just objects where there's a lot of pressure. Right? Yeah. Is that a fair? Yeah, it's basically the effort a body makes to cool itself down. But if that thing is already cold, um, it just has to be a little bit warmer inside and a bit colder outside that it wants to lose that heat. By the way, can I say that space volcano is how I uh, described an ex-boyfriend who was both a pothead and had a temper. So (laughs) (laughs) I didn't actually realize it was a real thing. So I'm I'm learning a lot right now. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. Potheads have tempers. I thought that, <laughs> that was what that was, was remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was weird about him, you yeah. know? <laughs> so, so Nagin, did you collect questions for us for this Cosmic Query? I did. There's so many great questions. Well, um, let's, let's head right in. Let's, let's head right in with uh, Philip Lyons from Patreon. He asks... Oh, wait, I you under- Patreons first because they Patreons pay. Patreons yeah. go first. 
worse because they yeah, really they support. <laughs> I understand that Comet Neowise was recently discovered in March, given how long its orbital period is around the sun. How can we be sure that it originated in our solar system? Good one, Natalie. That is, yeah, I, I, I always, I'm kind of always nervous during cosmic queries because it feels like an exam. Like, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. I know this. Oh. oh my goodness. What are they going to ask? I'm so scared. Like, I do, right, I know it. I know, it. I know the answer. Right. Um, okay, so the thing about comments is Wait, wait, so Natalie, if I see you, like, peeking at your palm with yeah. your hand <laughs> with your notes. <laughs> <It's my> notes. <laughs> All right, Natalie, you have about 30 seconds to answer this question and go. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so comets are really small. Let's just get that out there first, okay? So they're really hard to see in the solar system. So when they're coming in towards the inner solar system, um, that's the only time we can really see them in any detail. Wait, and quantify most, how small? How small? Uh, well, the near wise is about five kilometers across. So okay. it's about like three miles if you're in old money. Good. Um, so that's not huge. If we're looking at that from the Earth and it's really far away, we're not going to see it very easily. Um, now, most of the time, comets live really, really far away. They live in the far out of each of the solar system, past the orbits of all the planets. Um, they live in somewhere called the Kuiper Belt, and then even further out, this kind of theoretical region called the Oort Cloud. Um, so there's lots of them out there, possibly billions of them, um, and sometimes they get diverted into the inner solar system to bring them a bit closer to the sun, which is what happened with Neowise. Now, it comes in and actually it was on a different orbital period to start with, but its interaction with the sun changed its orbital period. So it got longer. So I think it's gone from like around 4,000 years to around 6,000 years to get around the sun and all the way back again. So it's a very, it's a long period comet is what we say. And this tells us that it came from very far away because if it had come from closer to us, it wouldn't take so long to go around the sun. Um, so we worked out its orb orbital period and we know it's not coming back for quite some time. Um, now, what was the end of that question? Have I answered that correctly? Wait, wait, so is, how do we know it's from this solar system and not from somewhere ah, else? Ah, okay. So the reason we know it's from this solar system is mostly related to its speed. Now, if something was coming from another solar system, another star system, way out, then it would be traveling extremely fast to have exited its solar system and to be orbiting um, and to be traveling through um, the galaxy. Now, we've had that happen before. There was a, an object that was called a Muamua, um, which was this strange object that we saw very last minute. Um, and we didn't know if it was a comet or an asteroid. We're still not 100% sure. We think it was probably a dead comet. Um, but it came from some other star system. And it traveled through our solar system so quickly that it didn't even get captured into orbit around our sun. It couldn't have cared less that we were here. It just went straight through, zooming straight past. So the fact that we can kind of measure the speed or the velocity of this comet in space and neowise, we can figure out it's come from within our solar system. And we can roughly work out from where it came and then where it's going back to. All right, so in other words, if you calculate an orbit and it turned out to be infinity, <laughs> Then it's never coming back, and it was an interloper, right? But yeah. you, you calculate the orbit, and there's an actual number that comes out of that equation with six or seven thousand years, right? Yeah. Wait, and yeah. it's just hanging out in this spot? What, Neo wise? No, it's, yeah. it's always on this orbit. So it's some of them stay out in the outer solar system, but then occasionally comets get kind of bumped into the inner solar system because they might have interacted with a big planet um, that kind of orbited past and kind of threw them off their happy orbit and then threw them towards the sun, essentially, because the sun is really, really big. And so it's got tons and tons of I've gravity. Heard, so yeah. it pulls out. You've heard? <laughs> Gossip on the streets is the sun's real big. <laughs> it's actually ninety nine point nine percent of the mass of the solar system, right? So I was just going to say that, but in, thank you for I, saying I, that. I can see you. I can see you thinking it. <laughs> so it pulls everything towards it. Um, so that's what happens with this comet. If it gets knocked out of its orbit, it then kind of comes hurtling towards the sun. They don't always go very close to the sun. They're still some distance away. Um, but if they get too close, they can get heated up so much that they just disintegrate completely, which has happened quite a lot of times. But this one was safe. It didn't go too close and it managed to kind of skirt around the sun and it's going back out now. It's on its way back out to the outer solar system. All right. All right. Well, uh, question numero dos comes from um, also from Patreon. Ari Maudi uh, says, why is it comets don't orbit in a circular orbit like the planets do, but instead have a very elongated orbit, even though they all orbit the sun? Shouldn't a comet orbit 
uh, like the planets, the way out in the Oort cloud. Uh, you mentioned the Oort cloud just now. By the way, who names these clouds and stuff? Because why isn't it named like Brad or Larry or something? <laughs> like, why do they all have <laughs> these, like, you so know, things, science was, nerd names? I think the Oort cloud was named after Jan Oort. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. 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 So, oh, um, okay. so it's named after usually the person that discovers them. So if you discover something awesome, then, you know, you get to put your name to it quite often, which is really That's nice. That's cool. Um, but the or, wait, or just I can add. If yeah. out of respect for you, if you make the discovery, then other people talking about your research paper will then coin that term. So Jan Ort did not say, I've discovered the Ort cloud. <laughs> he didn't say that in his paper. He just did a calculation and showed there are all these comets that come in from very long orbits, and they don't spend much time here. But if you look at the gravity of the situation, when you're far away from the sun, you're moving slowly. So then he did some math on this and figured there must be a place out there that has billions of comets and those, and, and all, in all directions around the sun. And then that paper gets published and everyone says, hey, there's this cloud of comets that Jan Oort hypothesizes and said it became the Oort cloud at that point. Yeah. That so how come they're not circular orbits, Natalie? What's up with that? So, okay, so most of the Oort or cloud comets are just sat out there and they're basically forming this shell around the solar system. So if you imagine all of the planets and the asteroids, they all sit in a plane. Um, and that's that's where we all kind of circle around the sun. They're all in the same plane, pretty much anyway. And then the Kuiper Belt comets are all also in that plane. But then the, the Oort cloud comets, because they're so far away, they're not kind of bound to the solar system by the gravity in the same way that all the planets are. So they just form this shell. And that's pretty much how we know they're there. We've never been there. We've never directly observed them um, in the Oort cloud. But sometimes when they come into the inner solar system, they get diverted in. They end up on this very kind of elliptical orbit that brings them into the around the sun much closer and that's how they end up on these and that's how we know they're there because they kind of come and visit us and then they disappear again out to their home in this shell around the solar system are you suggesting that if all comets in fact did have circular orbits we would never know they were there because they would uh, never come yeah. closer to the sun rendered visible by the by the heat of the sun yeah, I mean, definitely the Oort cloud ones. Of course, with the Kuiper belt, we've now been there because we've had um, we had the Voyager missions have gone through the Kuiper belt now, and then we've had um, the New Horizons NASA mission that went to visit Pluto, which is actually a Kuiper belt object. It's not a comet, but it's this big dwarf planet sitting out in the Kuiper belt. And Nagin, so those are fighting words. It. She just said that casually. <laughs> did, you hear, did you hear that, Nagin? So, uh, Pluto, yeah, it's a Kuiper belt object. That's all. It's in the Kuiper belt. Okay. <laughs> Planet. It's a We've all been put on notice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that just slipped out of her mouth. I just want you to know. Okay. The um, great thing about New Horizons is it went to look at another object in, in the Kuiper Belt. So we got to see this icy object that's sitting out there. So we are actually now getting out there and visiting these things and seeing them in their home. We don't have to wait for them to come to us. But those missions are really tricky because by the time you get out there, you're going to be traveling really fast away from, from the sun. And so you don't get a very long time to look at these objects. We just literally zoomed past Pluto and took a million images whilst we were there. And they're still being processed. So we, we don't get long to look at these. It's really hard to enter into orbit around one of these things that's so far away. But we, we are going there now. Well, wait, but so would you say then that most of the objects in the Kuiper Belt are on roughly circular orbits? And so we'll never see them unless they get jostled and set loose and plunge down back towards the sun. Yeah, I think, you know, that's fair to say because there's so many millions of them out there. And, and there are, we do get what we call near-Earth comets, which are the ones that are diverted towards the sun and come and visit us. But they're not that frequent. Like, we have quite a few of them, but it doesn't happen that often that, you know, we're going to need to worry about it too much. So, so Nagin, the, the near-Earth comet, that's code for comet that could one day render us extinct. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> just want to clarify that. It's funny because it seems like such an innocent term, <laughs> and yet it's so deadly and horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a but, near Earth object that took out the dinosaurs. It came really <laughs> near the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> But I was half expecting you to say that the reason comets go in sometimes these oval shapes or whatever is because of Russian trolls. You know what I mean? Like they're, uh, Russian trolls can be attributed with a lot right now. And um, this might be one of them. I'm just throwing that out there. I want you to look into it. 
Okay. We'll get top people, top people working on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> we t- have time for one more before we take our first break. Okay, and let's go to, ooh, I love this question from Julia Casey, also from Patreon. Um, she writes, what unanswered questions about comets do you most want to see answered in your lifetime? Okay, that's a great question. So right? I think one of the really hot topics at the moment is trying to figure out whether, what what the role that comets, what was the role that comets played in life on Earth? Because we don't know where we came from. We don't understand how life got here and we don't understand how it started on Earth. We also don't understand where all our water came from. And these two things are really linked. Um, We think we need water to make life and we think we need water to sustain life on a planet or anywhere. Um, But we don't understand where all those things came from. And it could be that comets and or asteroids delivered um, the, the building blocks for life and also water to our planet in the past. We know they collided with us about four and a half billion years ago. There were a lot of collisions um, of comets and asteroids into our planet. They brought all their goodies with them. And some of those goodies were organic material and a lot of water. So it might be that they delivered the building blocks for life. And then we need to understand how then we got life because it's not good enough to just say, oh, there's organic matter. We have life because it's not that simple. We don't understand that next step in science of of how we produce organisms like us. So Natalie, you have unique expertise coming from a volcano, a volcano background, where we know they put water into the atmosphere, and now you're thinking about comets. So you could have the package of how to make all the water we've ever had. Well, is that, so yeah, maybe. Okay, so yeah, volcanoes release a lot of water. They release a lot of lot of gases into the atmosphere. Some of them good, some of them bad, but they don't actually have a, a, a bad negative effect on, on the climate as such. But the problem is we don't know where that water came from within the Earth. So volcanoes erupt out material from inside the planet. Um, and so the material that's inside the planet has to have been there either from the start when the Earth formed or it was delivered later on and incorporated into the inside of the planet so that it could then be erupted out. Um, now, we may have started with all our water. When our sun formed and we formed all the planets and all the comets and asteroids around the sun, it might be that we had all our water from the beginning, that we're actually, we've got interstellar water. So our water might actually not be basically from our sun. It might have come from interstellar space, which would be really, really awesome to think we're drinking water that's older than our sun. But we just don't know because the Earth was really inhospitable when it first formed. It was boiling. It was just a molten ball of magma. So it's hard to understand how we might have maintained water within that really hot blob of magma because it probably would have all boiled off. So this is why scientists sometimes say, okay, maybe we brought that water in later on. Maybe it came from these asteroids that have a bit of ice on them. Maybe it came from these comets, which are very icy, Um, but we just don't know. So that's one of the major questions we're trying to answer at the moment, where it all came from. And can Brita filter water that's older than the sun is another <laughs> no. question. This is, uh, but I, I, lo- I would love for you to figure that out. That uh, like the explanation of life on Earth, which is like just a small answer to that question, because it, because then it explains everything. Like sloths, why are they such a weird animal? And cargo pants, why? Like it literally ex- then explains everything. So everything. you can be holding the key. <laughs> Everything, the key explainer. We got to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will return to my co host, Nagin Farsad, and my special guest, Natalie Starkey, comet expert, when we return. Exploring the secrets of the cosmos is a fascinating pursuit, but have you discovered the vast and incredible potential of your own mind? Introducing Advanced Nootropic Formula from B-Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand. Available at vitaminshop.com or your local Vitamin Shop store. This stimulant-free formula supports cognitive function, neuron development and repair, and brain-derived nootropic factor to promote the survival of existing neurons and encourage growth of new synapses. Non-GMO advanced nootropic formula features clinically studied ingredients like synapsa for peak cognitive performance, cognizant for mental energy, focus, and attention, and clinically proven in extra so you can stay extra sharp. In fact, you may experience an improvement in alertness for up to five hours. As always, 
All V Thrive, the Vitamin Shop brand products, are simply clean with no magnesium, stearic, stearic acid, or titanium dioxide. Advanced Nootropic Formula comes with a quality promise you can trust with ingredient purity and potency verified by independent third-party labs. The best part? It's on sale. Save 15% on purchases of $40 or more when you use code STARTALK at vitaminshop.com today. Again, that's 15% off purchases of $40 or more with code STARTALK on vitaminshop, S-H-O-P-P-E dot com to expand your mental universe today. So you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your schedule. Well, WGU and their programs are built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable and even makes it possible to graduate faster. Plus, you can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year. Fees included. That's right. You heard me. That is the correct. It's not. Nope. $8,700 per year. Let your experience and dedication help you earn your degree faster. See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. With no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, you can really earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own schedule. The low tuition rate covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means the faster you learn, the more you'll save. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash star talk that's wgu.edu slash star talk for your 65 dollar application fee poof gone waived we're back star talk cosmic queries my co-host, Nagin Farsad. Nagin. Uh, you have a Twitter handle, Nagin? You want to tell everybody? Yes, it's Nagin Farsad, N-E-G-I-N-F-A-R-S-A-D. Okay. It's just your name. It's just my name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when I said you have a Twitter talk, yes, I do. Here it is. It's Nagin Farsad. <laughs> so unexpected. So I know, I was, unexpected. I, it's my I, name. I, I, I was ready for some other thing. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> and my, I know. I really set you up for like, it's Fizzledy Doo, so- 43. You know, no, it's not. It's just my name. Well, the real Nagin Frasad, because so many <laughs> others have, have stolen it. Um, and uh, Natalie, Natalie, are you also on Twitter? I am, yes. Yeah, at Starkey Stardust. So, yeah, my name, Starkey. S- see, Nagin, that's how you do yeah. that. Nagin, that's how you do that, okay? <laughs> I'm taking notes. Starkey Stardust. Okay, so we're in Cosmic Queries mode, and we're talking about comets. Of course, inspired by the recent appearance of Comet Neowise in the sky. So, what, what's up next do you have there? Up next, we have a question from Twitter at Saltsy83 asks, would you expect to find amino acids on Neowise? And could the Neowises of the universe be the life distributors? Which you kind of mentioned a little bit about that before. Yeah, yeah, we touched on this in, in the last question, but actually, yeah, we're getting a bit more detail now. So yes, we know that we've got amino acids on comets. So I would very much expect Comet Neowise to contain amino acids. So we've now discovered them on two comets, which is pretty much the only comets we've studied in detail in space. The first one was Comet Vilt 2, which was visited by NASA Stardust, and they collected samples to bring back to Earth, and they found the amino acid glycine in now, glycine is the most simple, the most simplest amino acid, um, but it's there. So that's very exciting. Now, we corroborated that finding with the Rosetta mission, which is a European space agency mission, and it went to uh, Comet 67P. When it was on the surface of the comet, it actually um, put a lander down onto the surface and it analysed all sorts of things, bits of dust and gas that were coming off the comet. And it, and it also found amino acids on the comet, again, glycine. So we know we have them. We know comets collide with the planet. And so they would have bought that inventory of amino acids, possibly other amino acids as well. We haven't found them yet, but they might be there. They brought them to our planet in the past. So there's every chance that they did deliver life here, what we would call life in inverted commas, but obviously to go from amino acids to complex organisms is a really big step that we don't currently understand. So, so Natalie, what you're saying is we were two for two in the 
comets that we could have known whether they had amino acids. So we're saying we're good with that. Yeah, Let's, I, we I can think assume it's that. safe. And it's that we've found amino acids in asteroids a lot. So meteorite samples that are rocks that come from asteroids and land on our planet, or they can come from other planets as well. But the asteroid or meteor, meteorites um, also have tons of amino acids. In fact, in one particular asteroid sample, we found more, more amino acids than we have on our planet. So there's more variation in space than we, ha than we need to account for all the life we have here. So You mean more kinds of amino acids? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, so life elsewhere could just have, could be more interesting than we are. It might just rely on different, you know, bundles of amino acids to make life. We have no idea. We absolutely have no idea. But they're there. So they, that's the great thing. We have it. We've got the evidence that they're all over the solar system. But now we've just got to understand that next step of, of how we get life. So, Nagin, that's the name of your next book, How to Make Aliens Laugh. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you can... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so amino acid, I have a multivitamin that contains amino acids. Is it that same amino acids that you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, I like think it's all you, the same. I've never really looked at the multivitamin, what is in it, but yeah, um, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it gives me good, uh, you know, nails and hair. So, exactly. uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, comets have great updos, is basically <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, so Natalie, what's going to happen is Nagin's going to visit the, the meteorite hall of the museum. She's, she's going to start licking the meteorites. That's what she's going to start doing. <laughs> <laughs> trying to yeah, get her no, vitamins no and minerals. Yeah, no need to buy these supplements anymore. <laughs> Just go lick the meteorite. That's an excellent point, Neil. Nagin, step away from the meteorite. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. Oh, and just uh, before the next question, uh, Natalie, could you uh, tell me how Neil Wise got its name? Oh, yeah. That's actually a really interesting topic. It, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but I won't. I'll try and do the short version. So, comets, Maybe the 30-second version. Yeah, <laughs> comets okay. are generally named after the, the people that find them, or in the case of Neowise, the telescope that, that found it. And it's called Neowise. It's in space. It's a space telescope. Um, so it's a, probably a group of people working on it. So we couldn't just give it one name. But previously, it would have just been one person looking through a telescope, and, and they found the comet, and they got to name it after themselves. So that's why they tend to have you know, like Halley's Comet and all this, so it was Edmund Halley. Um, but they also have a, a, a really boring designation. So it's also called C slash 2020 F3, which tells you a little bit more about the type of comet. So the C means it's non-periodic, so it, it doesn't come round the sun very often. It's more than 200 years it takes to go around the sun. The 2020 tells you the year it was found or discovered. And then the F3 tells you a little bit more about the exact month um, that it, it was discovered. So it tells you it's the end of March that it was, it was discovered. And it was the third comet at the end of March to be discovered. So it tells you tons of information, but we tend to just call it Neowise because it's much friendlier. I think you're underselling it a little bit because I, C slash 2020 slash F3, I think is going to be a very popular baby name coming up. <laughs> Just wait, it'll trend. Born, born or conceived under the comic. <laughs> <laughs> so Natalie, actually, Edmund Halley didn't discover Halley's Comet. Really? No, he did not. Okay, there we go. Oh, he, I'm learning. Yeah. Obviously, I always learn from you, Neil, because okay. <laughs> you are the brain here. <laughs> yeah, what, what he did was he took Newton's equ new equations of gravity and applied it to a comet that was in the sky and noticed that it was the same comet that had come around in previous records. Because now we can right. understand orbits, you can now think of comets not as singular objects, but as, and so, so, but as recurring um, visitors yeah. to the inner solar system. So using that, he made a prediction of when it would come again. Okay. And so everyone just waited with, with, you know, bated breath. And there it was. It came right when he said, right where he said it would come. And from then on, it was named after. He was long dead by then, though. That's what, what had happened. And I think so that's a little cool fact. It's due back in, like, 2060, I guess. So, you know, I hope I'm still around to see that. Yeah, 2060. Yeah, I think that is, because it was um, 1986. And it's every 75 years or so. Yeah. Right, right, right. Cool. So, Nagin, you got another question. We have another question. It comes from Instagram. Is it possible to measure the rate at which a comet loses its mass as it travels across the solar system? Yeah. I and let me add to that, Natalie. If you do that calculation, can you tell us when it will disappear completely? 
Okay, so the answer to both these questions is no. Well, no, there's no simple way to do this, but we've we've done it sort of once, really. We've done it with the Rosetta mission, that European Space Agency mission. And the only way we could do it with that mission is because um, the orbiter and the lander were with the comet the whole time. So it, they kind of approached it when it was around the orbit of Mars, Jupiter kind of place. They then stayed with that comet the whole way past the sun, and then came out the other side. So what they were able to do was look at the processes that were happening as this comet was heated up and its ices were sublimating into space and it was experiencing that very hot environment near the sun and as it came out the other side and they could measure how much material was coming off it. And what they estimated is that about a meter of the surface of the comet was lost during that orbit around the sun. Wow. That comet's about three by five kilometers. So a similar kind of um, size to Comet Neowise, but there's so many factors that will control how much it loses. It will depend on how much volatile material it has within it, the stuff that, that streams off into space. It will depend what exactly is its composition, how much ice it has compared to dust. It will depend on how close it goes to the sun. There's so many factors that will affect that, that we couldn't simply apply that one metre rule to every comet that goes near the sun, because they'll all be different. But it gives us a good idea for that particular comet that they do lose a lot of material, and that's, you know, a huge amount so every time they go via the sun that happens and so eventually they die we kind of say that they die they don't have any volatile material left the ice is all gone so they've got no more material to lose as they go via the sun um, and then they just they don't have a tail anymore they're no longer a comet really um, so but it, it's hard to say how long that's going to take and how many orbits that takes to happen my takeaway from this is that comets are always dieting and that basically <laughs> body shaming is happening in the solar system in a way that I had no idea and I am not on board with it. <laughs> yeah, losing a meter, that's, that's, that's a... <laughs> so, so literally, the, the comet is, literally, is being flayed by the sun. Mm. That's, that's, that's sad. I know, I know, but then we wouldn't see them otherwise, because unless that process happened, as comets oh, kind yeah. of reach okay. the orbit around Jupiter, um, that's when they start to get heated up, and that's when they'll start to produce what we call this coma, which is the kind of the atmosphere that surrounds that rocky nucleus um, that makes up the comet. So they start to get heated up and the, the ice within them, there's lots of different types of ice in a comet. It could be water ice, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, lots of different types of ice. Like the, we big, think of the only big one cubes they use and bars. <laughs> yeah. Is that in there too? <laughs> there is so carbon, yeah, we've got dry ice because that would be the carbon dioxide stuff. So basically they all um, get sublimated, which means they turn from solid to gas at different stages as they're going towards the sun. The first one to come off is generally carbon monoxide and that kind of glows blue. So if you often see images of Comet Neowise, they've got this kind of blue halo around the, the comet nucleus and that starts to then stream off into the tail, that material. Um, so that's actually just the comet losing its mass and that all that material is just streaming out behind it along with dust particles that are coming off at the same time. So it's it's kind of, it can be quite a violent environment um, on the surface of the comet as different portions of it get heated up differently and then jets of gases can shoot off and it can be quite crazy. So Natalie, everything I know about that, I, I learned from the movie Armageddon. <laughs> 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 when they landed on the surface of the comet and it rotates into the sunlight and then you know, geysers start popping out and yeah. Yeah, it, I don't want to say that was the only accurate part about that movie. I, was, <laughs> I don't even think it was that accurate, but hey, yeah. I'm glad you, you have a mental image at least. <laughs> I do, I do. So Nagin, what else you have for us? Okay, and we also have from Twitter, um, oh, hello from Cape Verde, which is such an exotic oh, location cool. to be sending Ooh. a volcanic message I from. I think they're volcanic islands, aren't they? Nice. Yeah, I think so, too. Anyway. Mm -hmm. oh, I'd take my dream to go visit. My dear friends, uh, theoretically, can we harvest water from asteroids and comets to solve water crises and famines here on Earth? And if so, wouldn't that seem more important slash practical than starting a colony on Mars? Yeah, wow. I mean... And, and, and before you get to that, Natalie, let me just say, we had an entire live, Star Talk Live program on water, not only on Earth, but in the solar system. And I had not fully appreciated how much rarer potable fresh water is becoming on Earth. Yeah. You know, water, water all around and not a drop 
to drink. So what is the nature of the water on comets? And why can't we just lasso one and bring it in and make a lake of it and, and dip in our straws? Well, yeah, the thing is, first of all, obviously, we're going to be much better placed looking after our own water supplies, making fresh, clean water for ourselves and not polluting the rest of our planet. Um, and having a lot of salt water is a problem because obviously we don't want to drink salt water. Now, when we go into space, um, there are other moons and stuff that have water on them, but it tends to be salty water. That's good for life in that life can survive in there, but it's not stuff that we want to drink. So sure enough, if we were to travel out into space and we wanted to go and you know live on Mars, not sure that's going to be a good idea, but anyway, if we did, um, we would need water, and there's no water on Mars that we do, we don't think there's much anyway. Um, there might be some in the subsurface, but it's we don't know. So we could kind of travel by a comet on the way and and get some water. We could just melt some of that comet, separate out the water, ice from you know all those other types of ices that it contained, and sure enough, we could use that in space. And we do think that um, that is one of the ways we might be able to explore further into the solar system. Um, but it has its problems. We, it, it just, it's not going to be very easy to do, just kind of fly by a comet and grab some water. It's not that simple. Um, but it's definitely not something we'll be doing to bring back to Earth. It's not going to be practical to transport water back to our planet. And even though there's a lot of it in space, we're better off looking after our own water here. So there's an interesting corollary to that because it still costs NASA about $10,000 a pound to put a payload into space. Mm. So if I launch you and you want to drink 16 ounces of water, if I set up a mining colony that mines frozen water from, ast from asteroids and comets, melts it, then I sell it to NASA, but for on space activities. Mm. And I'll sell it to NASA for $7,000. Yeah. I, I can do that. And then if some, if it gets cheaper, I'll sell it for 5,000, whatever. But I can m imagine a future, however distant, where the water that we do harvest from comets goes to other activities in space rather than, I agree, it'd be impractical just to bring it back to Earth. Yeah, and at the moment, anybody that goes up and grabs an object in space, like an asteroid or a comet, can own, I think, pretty much like an, American citizens anyway can own whatever they find in space. I, I have a feeling the rest of the world is catching up with those laws. Um, so yeah, you could do that. If you could go and mine a comet or an asteroid, you can for sure then sell it, whatever materials you get from it to whoever wants them. But that's been an American rule ever since the beginning. We find it and then it's ours. <laughs> <laughs> how, the, how the country was built. <laughs> that's right. But the really cool thing about water is that you can also use it as um, propulsion for, for rocket fuel. So you can, if you can split the hydrogen and the oxygen out of the water, water being H2O molecule, um, and the hydrogen and the oxygen, then you can use that um, as propulsion as well. So it's not just for humans living, but it's also to get further into space because... As you said, launching anything off our planet is incredibly expensive because we have a lot of gravity. So if we can get our fuel in space without having to take it with us from the Earth, that's a real bonus as well. Yeah, excellent. All right. And... Negin. We Come, also... You got more for us. We've got a question from Instagram um, from at Gabriel Joachim. How do different chemical compositions change the color of the comet? Nice question, because I've seen pictures of the comet and there's all these beautiful colors in it. I want to know where that comes from, except we have to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we will all learn from Natalie Starkey how comets get their colors on Star Talk. Are you always taking care of your family? Do you often take care of others and not yourself? Well, now's the time to take care of yourself because you deserve it. Teladoc gives you access to licensed therapists to help you get back to feeling your best, to feeling like yourself again. Sometimes we don't know how much we need to talk to somebody. Take it from me personally. During the entire pandemic, I have had virtual sessions and it has been such an incredible help. Now with Teladoc, you can speak to a licensed therapist by phone or video. Therapy appointments are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. local time. Hey, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you feel stressed or anxious or depressed or lonely, or you might be struggling with a family issue. Teladoc can help. 
No need to wait months to get a therapist. Teladoc is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy to change counselors if needed for free. Teladoc therapy is available through most insurance or employers, and individual plans are also available. Download the app or visit teladoc.com slash StarTalk today to get started. T-E-L-A-D-O-C dot com slash StarTalk. We'd like to give a Patreon shout out to the following Patreon patrons Matthias Mancini and Sandra Bolliger. Thanks so much for being our bright shining star. Without you, we couldn't do this show. And if anyone else listening would like their very own Patreon shout out, please go to patreon.com slash star talk radio and support us. <laughs> We're back. Start talking Cosmic Queries comments. I've got Nagin Fassad, my co-host, and Natalie Starkey, who's our resident comment expert, except she's in the UK right now. So she's a resident of somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, Nagin, somebody just asked about comet colors. Is that right? That's right. They asked, um, what, like, how do different chemical compositions change the color of the comet? So how does the leopard get its spots? And how do comets get their colors? See, this should be in the same book. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's a great question because it's one of the ways we can figure out what comets are made of because we can look at their colors as they come into the inner solar system and it tells us what is literally coming off their surface, which ices are sublimating and turning from solid to gas as they, they get hotter. So I mentioned earlier that the first gas um, that tends to come off is carbon monoxide and that glows blue. Um, Neil can probably explain the physics reason behind all the ions interacting and why that glows blue. Do you want to? <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> but it glows blue. Let's just say there's some interaction with the physics. No, no, I can tell you. No, I, I, I can tell you. So these these molecules um, have certain sort of energy states and, that they exist in, and if they're fed another energy source, they can you can kick electrons off of them, or you can bump them up into a higher energy state, and then they release that energy back to you but in a very specific part of the spectrum. And then you, so, and different compounds, different different molecules, different atoms have different colors corresponding to what their energy levels are. So that it's it's not deeper than that. And that's going on all the time. So yeah, so go on. Now. You see, this is, that's the exam question, isn't it? That I should have been. <laughs> my high school chemistry teacher will be like, oh, Natalie, you should know this stuff. <laughs> but by the way, do you remember the glow in the dark Frisbees? You know, you, you'd put it under a light and then you'd throw it. Does yeah. it play Frisbee yeah. anymore? It, it glows this kind of pale green. Well, when you put it under regular light and it bumps up the energy levels, and then when you take it away from the light, the the um, electrons descend and emit this green light yeah. corresponding to the material that's in the, in the, in the Frisbee itself. So, and it doesn't do that forever, right? You only get to play with it for 10 or 15 minutes before you don't see that uh, signature at all. But the comet is constantly getting stoked by the sun. So you get these colors sustained. So, you, so colors, go on. you can sometimes get a green color, which I think is related to um, elemental carbon, because we know there's a lot of carbon in comets. Um, the dust particles tend to be made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen particles. So all the stuff for life, it's brilliant. Um, you can also sometimes get a red tail, um, which is, so you, with, with comets, you tend to have two main tails. The first one is, is made of dust, and that can be quite diffuse. It tends to be sort of either white, gray, kind of yellow colored. You get the second tail, which is the ion tail, which is these gases that have come off, and that tends to be blue or greeny colored. And then sometimes there's this sodium tail, which is red. And I think actually it was seen with Comet Neowise. There were three different tails coming off this comet. So you've got the comet traveling towards the sun, and these tails all face away from the sun, basically. Right, so tail is a misnomer on its way out of the solar system, mm. out, of, out of the inner solar system, right? If it goes out tail first, yep. we think of tail as something that trails. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's, it's it, only trailing on its way in. Yeah, the tail ends up ahead of the comet, or the tail Ahead of the um, comet, yeah. But they're not all in line with each other, because obviously the dust and the, the ion gases, they get distributed differently, and they react differently to the gravity of the sun mm -hmm. and the solar wind and everything. So they end up being separated, and that's how you can see them. And I mean, some of the images that people have got of this comet have been absolutely amazing. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, my, yeah. And everybody's got a great camera, and you don't need full telescopes to do this anymore. Yeah. 
just a camera with a good lens. Yeah. Not like the, the old days. I sound like an old man. <laughs> Get off my lawn. I got my, my day. <laughs> we used to. <laughs> so, Nagin, mm. uh, can we go into lightning round? Lightning round. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. it's not up to you. It's up to Natalie oh, to answer questions. Okay. I'll try my best. And, yeah, let's say, <laughs> pretend you're on the evening news and they just want sound bites. <laughs> Okay, this, so this is your soundbite quiz, okay? <laughs> so, Nagin, what do you have? All right, Rob, uh, Kirsten from the Netherlands writes on Instagram, let's say... A com- oh, by the way, by the way, Jan Ort was from the Netherlands. Oh, there it is. Just the, the, <laughs> the, the, the Dutch have had a long, uh, t- in the 20th century, a very long and proud history of participating in cosmic discovery. Just thought I'd give a toss out to the, uh, the Dutch. But go on, okay. Uh, does Comet Haley always have the same tail, tail color every time it comes around the sun? The chemical composition burns, but can a comet gain other chemical compositions on its way to us? Um, yeah, so it'll, I think it should theoretically always glow the same color because it will have the same ices within it. But as they get depleted, it, I guess it could change color with each orbit of the sun, but it definitely isn't going to gain any material as it goes by the sun. It'll only be losing stuff. Good short answer. Let me ask, could there be a layer below that's different from the layers above that yeah, then gets I, revealed as a new chemical signature? Completely. We, we have no idea because we haven't studied enough comets up close and we haven't studied enough over the course of uh, an orbit. So, yeah, we don't know. They could be completely different as they go, as you delve down into them. It's great. We have no idea. Lots to find out okay. still. It's like a seven-layer nacho dip. <laughs> um, <laughs> more to discover. Okay. Um, okay. We have from Oxford comma twenty at, on Twitter. How many Oxford comma twenty? Oh, this is we got a <laughs> a literate person here. Okay, let's, let's do that. How many encounters with the inner solar system do comets from the Kuiper Belt and Oort cloud get before they're totally steam cleaned and become plain old asteroids? Oh, I like that. So we had a similar question earlier, and actually, it's again we don't know. We don't really know for any individual comet how long it's going to take for it to just die and lose up all its ices. So we just have to study each one in detail. And then once we see what it does on its first orbit, that we look at it, we've got to wait till it comes back and see how it reacts again. We really have no idea, but we have observed comets that are then dead. So we know that that can happen. Um, But how long it takes for that to happen, we, we really don't know at the moment. So when you say dead, you don't mean destroyed. You mean there's nothing to evaporate to render it visible. Exactly. So they just end up as like a hunk of rock in the end. What I'm gathering from all of this is that comets are a really fickle lover. You know, you just don't know what they're going to do, how they feel. You just don't know. (laughs) Exactly. So, Nagin, keep going. All right. So, get, oh. keep, so get two more. We got like one minute left. Okay, we have two more. Here and we Natalie's go. on a roll. She's got. She's, <laughs> she's knocking these out. Okay, go. From Real Tired Hours on Instagram, um, I want to know if comets orbit all the same direction in the same way planets do. And if not, what would it look like if two comets collided while visible from Earth with the naked eye? I want to oh. know that too. Yeah, that would be so cool. Okay, so we've seen comets disintegrate when they go near the sun. I mentioned this earlier when, you know, these things are very very volatile. They, they are very fragile because they're made, they're basically a, a snowball with a bit of dirt in. So if they go too close to the sun, they can explode. And we have sort of seen that with um, a telescope before. Um, but if two were to collide in space, well, it, it's unlikely to happen. But if it were to happen, we would basically see these things sort of collide and disintegrate. It might not be as exciting as you might think, because like if you had two rocks colliding, because they probably just sort of melt into each other a little bit. Um, but if they were to collide in, in the outer solar system, um, they're going pretty kind of, it's kind of quite far apart out there and they're not kind of going to hit each other with very much force. So if they were to collide way out in the outer solar system, we wouldn't really see much, we wouldn't be able to see it happen anyway, but it, I don't think it would be very exciting. Ooh. Natalie, you're bumming us out. But this know. was a great question. Now you turned it into like, no, yeah, it's not going to be exciting. Yeah, Another like line. I was like, I was geared up for like the Macy's fireworks display, <laughs> and know. instead you're like, oh no, this is like the sad like Larry outside of Sheboygan <laughs> doing fireworks off his roof. You know, that's know. what we're going to see. Just, they're so fragile that I think nothing. Like if if they come into, they can collide with our planet, and they have done in the past. But actually, the only time we've ever kind of observed this happening, um, it, they. Can't kind of explode as they come through the atmosphere because they just can't maintain their shape um, because they're just not consolidated enough. They're not held together very well. And they tend to explode in the atmosphere before they even reach the surface of the planet. So, yeah, I don't think it'd be very exciting. All right. All right. Here's your last question. Last question. Go. 
Last question is from Dudes Priya on Facebook. Is it possible for a probe to hitch a ride on a comet? Maybe an extra solar comet that'll leave the solar system? Oh, lovely question. I like mm. this one. So, yeah, of course, we've done this with the European Space Agency mission, the Rosetta mission, which I've mentioned a few times because it was just one of these groundbreaking missions to a comet. It landed, a little lander, on the side of the comet. And as I said, it followed that comet then as it went via the sun and came out the other side. Um, and it's still there. So this comet is now heading out into the outer solar system again and that little lander is still with it. And they even had an orbiter with that comet, which they basically crash landed onto the comet because they were like, we can't do any science now. There's no sun. We need sun to have for our solar panels. What are we going to do with the spacecraft? We'll just crash land it or decelerate it into the comet. So they're now with it. Now, if you did that with a comet like a Muamua and it was going out of the solar system at great speed, then sure, you could then hitch a ride. You'd have trouble with power and it's very cold as you get away from the sun. So spacecraft don't really like that, but it is possible. Uh, let me add that it's not so much that you're hitching a ride because if you matched speeds to the interstellar object, Oumuamua, then once you match speeds, you don't have to attach to it because you will have the exact trajectory that Oumuamua would have. So yeah. it's an interesting fact. It's not like you just hook it and then it pulls you along. <laughs> it's you you're match, well, you've matched speeds. You're there. You are with the comet, whether you're touching it or not. And that but is, it is physics. Kind of, that's amazing. That, that's just <laughs> the physics of it. But I, Natalie, I think it's a, it's funny to think that we've got our hardware sitting on a comet so that the, with the, with the Rosetta mission. So the next time it comes around, if it's jostled loose, there's like a spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> getting jettisoned off the back of yeah. a comet. And that's what they were worried about when the comet went via the sun. The lander may have just been thrown off into space if a big jet of you know gases had shot off the comet when it got heated up. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it was a real... Mm -hmm. We had no idea what was going to happen because we'd never done it before. So, yeah. I Very am cool. super prone to motion sickness, so the idea of hitching a ride on a comet just sounds <laughs> horrifying to me. Just sounds like a vomit bag, a constant use of a vomit yeah, bag. Yeah, they spit yeah, I a think lot as well. Oh, I think, no, 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 Nagin, no you, thank you. You. Should, be, you should be more worried, worried about a jet spewing forth under you and then casting you back out into space rather than just being on the comet and worry that you might need some drama me. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to end it there. Nagin, uh, it's always great to have you. I always, it's the second time. Hope to see more of you as my co-host. So fun. I learned so much. And, and, and your book, How to Make White People Laugh, crazy title um, and even crazier uh, podcast title. Uh, what is it again? Fake the Nation. Uh, fake the Nation. Uh, good luck with those, and we hope to see you again. And Natalie, always good to see you. Keep it going. Uh, we'll look for you when you come back to New York. Yeah. And, and and maybe we can arrange for another comet for you to talk about. That would be amazing. Or an asteroid. I'll take any. And we've got loads of missions coming up at the moment going to asteroids, so there's so much we to want talk, to talk We want to learn about those as definitely, definitely. So thank you. And the title of your next book you're working on? It's called Fire and Ice, Space Volcanoes. Fire and ice, very nice, very nice. Okay, this has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, I bid you to keep looking up. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's important to take care of your mental health, and if you're looking for some tips on how to do just that, Here's Angela Kinsey and Jenna Fisher from the Office Ladies podcast. I know a lot of times people make resolutions in the new year, but to make a resolution stick, sometimes you have to examine some of the deeper issues that might keep you from reaching your goals. For example, you say, oh, I want to get in shape. And so you get a gym membership, but you don't take the time to unpack those reasons why you continue to make unhealthy choices. Oh, that's so good. Just you saying that is making me think why I don't exercise. Right? Sometimes you yes. think, oh, I don't deserve the time for myself. Why don't you think you deserve the time for yourself? BetterHelp is a great place to unpack some of these bad habits. BetterHelp offers online professional counselors who can help. You can connect with your counselor in a safe, private, and confidential online environment. These counselors are trained in a variety of areas. 2020 was a hard year. Yes. 
a lot of extra stress. A lot of us have been stuck in the same house with people, and maybe that's led to some relationship issues. I really like their approach to finding a counselor that meets your needs, because I think that's always the most intimidating part for me. BetterHelp is a convenient and affordable option, and our listeners get 10% off their first month with the discount code STITCHER. Get started today at betterhelp.com slash stitcher. The new year can be a good time for a mental health check-in. If you always wanted to try therapy, or you'd like to try it again, or if you just need to talk some things out, BetterHelp offers online licensed professional therapists who are trained to listen and to help with issues including relationship conflicts, depression, self-esteem, grief, and more. With BetterHelp, you can simply fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and then get matched with your counselor in under 48 hours. Easily schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus exchange unlimited messages with your therapist from anywhere. Everything you share is confidential, and if for any reason you're unhappy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time, at no additional charge. Join the 1 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp counselor. BetterHelp is a convenient and affordable option, and our listeners get 10% off their first month with the discount code STITCHER. Get started today at betterhelp.com slash stitcher. There's no shame in asking for help. 